Welcome, Miss Elaine Gould. Um, thank you, everybody. And um, let me know if you can't hear me clearly and if I speak too fast for you. Um, it is a great pleasure to speak to you this morning and I am so sorry not to be able to be at the conference in person. I'm sure you will have a really stimulating weekend and I hope you have a fantastic exchange of ideas and projects and I look forward to hearing about those in, in due course. Um, if anyone would like to speak to me personally who was hoping to meet me, um, then um, Werner may be able to set up something via the connection um, or via Skype, via, via Skype so that I can speak to you during the course of the weekend. Um, so do be in contact with him if you would, if you would like to, um, to do that. Um, so um, I will, I will talk, um, talk about music engraving, which has been um, my life's work really, one, one way and another. Um, I will start by saying that the music industry is, I think, in a, um, sorry, the music engraving um, that, we, that we all are here to discuss is in a very, very healthy place. Um, the fact that we're talking about it and examine it, examining it shows a renaissance in replacing the finesse and expertise um, that we nearly lost sort of 30 to 40 years ago um, when uh, the, the engravers and the publishing houses um, started to be replaced um, by emerging software developments. Um, thankfully, the scene is very, very different now. So to the title of my talk, does everyone need high quality engraving? Quite a few musicians don't realize they do, uh, and they don't understand that good engraving, the music setting, and good notation, uh, consistent and correct notation are the keys to a really successful piece of music. And by successful, I mean one that can be read really easily um, and is quick and easy to use. Um, some musicians may not have noticed this very obvious fact, um, but performers are more likely to make mistakes in low quality engraving. Even when you read when you read a very poor page of music spacing, it is really difficult not to make the errors in it. Um, first slide, please. Um, this piece um, is a disaster to play from. Um, I'm a cellist, I play this piece with my quartet. Every time I turn the page to this very quick movement, um, I'm reading by spacing and I'm making errors. And because um, because we are all trained to read by spacing, um, you can't break the habit, and every time you turn the page, you make an error. Uh, next extract. Um, I've included a page, a very small snippet here of choral music. Um, this is a piece that I've sung many times, um, and even in my very good choir of sight readers um, in London, Every time we rehearse this particular piece of music um, in these bars, the middle bar here, where there has been a correction uh, to the score at some point in the 7-8 bar, um, you are having to be hand clapping and foot stamping. At the same time, this is sufficient distraction without the poor spacing on the page. Um, and that is just the final trip hazard when you're trying to um, work out the irregular bars. In this, in this piece. Uh, the traditional uh, beaming in, of the notes, um, stems, set the stems per syllable, isn't very helpful either to reading the rhythms, um, and that's something I certainly um, never re recommend to anybody to do that in that way. It simply hampers you when you are reading those difficult bars anyway. So, it is very possible that many works have never entered the repertoire properly because they were produced with very bad uh, parts in the first place um, and that made performances 
first performance is not very convincing and um, substandard as well as the materials, um, which is a terrible thing to say, but maybe the case. So this means that we as the engra in engravers and developers have a heavy responsibility and the challenge to improve things. So it is good to see these challenges discussed in these conference days. So next example, please, which is the little example showing some trills, tremolos and harmonics. Um, as soon as a good musician sets eyes on a page, there will be doubt in their mind when, if the communication of the notation is not entirely clear. Um, the performer will sense that the composer or the engraver is not quite sure what they're doing. Are they aware that it does really matter when some techniques are written in different ways in the same place? Or are they different? Um, the communication on this page is lacking, which doesn't inspire confidence to the musician. I see notation as a message in a bottle. The composer engraver should pass all the essential information to the fellow musicians via the page and without being present themselves. Um, so do not forget the player really may not have access to other information, such as the full score um, in an orchestral part. They may need to simply get on with their part. So ev all, everything has to be there. And when a composer engraver is finishing the score, they have to bear that in mind. In this particular example, the player is going to ask, why are the trills written in three different ways? What is the relationship between the two note tremolos in the final bars and the trills. The figuration looks very similar. Should they be played in different ways? Are they the same? Is the notation of harmonics, um, why, why is the octave harmonic on the violin and uh, E string written in two different ways? Both notations are correct, but you wouldn't use both in isolated contexts such as this. And the whole Few bars just does give you, gives you no confidence that um, this is being thought about um, as a communication of what is really required here. Some simple markings, articulations, uh, maybe verbal explanations would explain in a performance note exactly what was needed for the player not to be puzzled. Performers do not want to spend their time. Um, a valuable rehearsal, practice time, asking questions because the notation isn't clear. They want to get on with learning the piece, uh, to concentrate on aspects of the performance other than looking <coughs> at the notes. Uh, so this is what we have to bear in mind when we're preparing things for them, how we can help them to do this, how we can help them to just play the music and be able to communicate across their music stand to the audience. Um, this is so very obvious, yet you wouldn't always think that um, when you look at the demands on the page that are sometimes presented um, for musicians to read. I look at some of these instances and with, with some music examples and suggest um, how we might make uh, life easier for musicians. As a practicing musician, musician myself and speaking on behalf of the music industry, we need both high quality, flexible engraving software programs and the good judgment of high quality music engravers. The two together will produce music on the page that is not only useful to read, but everything is in its proper place. The most elegant page, though, is no guarantee that it is completely fit for purpose. The purpose is surely to provide the musician with a set of instructions and to be mindful that, other than in solo repertoire and study scores, the musician will need to look at and communicate with other members of the ensemble. Um, so next, next slide, please. Please, the Debussy. <coughs> The primary concern for many of us, and I'm sure we will be talking about this a lot at the conference, 
in, um, in engraved work is spacing. Um, and this is quite correct. Um, this is a, ent a, entirely what um, a lot of us are puzzling about how to make look really good and what we can do about this. Um, my students tell me I am obsessed with talking about spacing and for good reason. Uh, musicians read rhythms by spacing in the first instance and we see immediately um, when it's not sufficient and needs time for the eye to adjust. In the second place, we need to look at the stems and the beams. Um, sorry, I mean to have the bird whistle example here. Um, so that should, that should have been the next slide, so I hope that's all right. So the score of um, bird whistle, mania, uh, the death of Orpheus, um, a typical score from the 1960s, 70s. Um, and the question is how to read um, figure the, the notation at figure six um, and to get that together as an ensemble when there is no indication as to how the bar is um, divided up. And I'm very sorry, I've missed... Uh, no, that's all right, um, that's fine. Um, so if the composer wishes figure six to be subdivided, um, the, the notation for this is completely missing in the score, and incidentally, if the parts are the same. This will waste rehearsal time whilst the conductor stops to explain how he wants the subdivisions to be. I've taken the subdivision hints from the vocal part, um, the dotted lines, and suggested a grouping of the ensemble, which will then be written as here. Next slide, please. So that's my rendition um, of what I think the parts could look like so that you can actually see at a glance how the bar is subdivided. And um, certainly it is really the composer's job to do this, but the engraver may need to step in um, to, to do this as well. Um, another feature of this same piece, and taken up in the same decade, demonstrated um, by Ligeti, is um, the score of Continuum, which I suspect many of you might know. Um, next slide, please, of the Ligeti uh, piece. As in the Burt Whistle, the notation is, is used to convey how the composer wants the material to be played here in one extremely fast, continuous phrase. Notation has a vast armory of other tools to express how you want something played. So I feel in this example, it's a real shame um, that the beats are not divided up more so that the hopscordist um, can see where the patterns repeat, um, where they change, um, this just seems to me that this would have been helpful information um, for the beams to, to have their primary function so that you can read small groups of notes um, rather than to tell the player how you want the piece to be played in a seamlessly legato line. Um, Ligeti even writes a performance note, as he often does, at the bottom of the piece telling you to play very evenly without any articulation of any sort. Um, so, yes, we have that information, so we don't need that in the beams as well. Um, and he also tells us um, the vertical lines are not bar lines. There is neither beat nor meter in this piece, but they serve as a means of orientation. Precisely, bar lines as a means of orientation. Um, I want them to be more visible. They are very, very delicate here. I guess that is to show that there should be no accentuation between the bars. But um, in this music in particular, I would love some thicker than stems, solid verticals, so that my eye can take in groups of notes um, to help me visually. Um, this is surely their function and it means to help the musician read that page a lot more easily. So, we have an image in our heads. What should a really good page look like? We know the general principles. Um, it should be an even spread of characters. Um, it chooses a stay size um, so that the content fills the page without too great an amount of white space around uh, within it. Given a good typesetting program, you may have a very even automated spacing, 
And this can um, be an essential element uh, of fluent reading. Um, so next example, please, the um, first Debussy uh, quartet. Um, so the very best editions have a page which is filled with music, um, but is, is it filled too much? Uh, even in this study school, I want to be able to read it, even though it is um, not to be conducted from or played from. But the balance of evenness and legibility, which works so beautifully in the whole of the rest of the school, just isn't present on this page. So what would I do differently? Um, firstly, I would offset the, uh, offset the bar lines of alternate systems. Um, to me, this is the biggest crime um, on a page. Um, one sets it beautifully and then doesn't notice these verticals of practically looking as if they're joining up. And then secondly, I would move the stage slightly apart and then the page can begin to breathe. So the next example shown my first, um, first idea. Um, to make that page immediately more legible. But then I thought, why should my eye need to travel so far for each next note if this is a study score? The horizontal spacing is very generous. So would this work with four bars a line? Next example, please. Yes, this works fine with four bars a line. So that, that's great. There could have been a very good pagination reason why that wasn't like that in the first place. but. Since I was experimenting, yes, it works beautifully um, with four bars a line. This Debussy example highlights a problem um, uh, that has emerged with the development of, of typesetting software, and that is the excessive uniformity of spacing. Um, this can be a problem um, in laying out phrases which are uniform in themselves. Um, if you're working to publication level, and have plenty of time to lavish on the page, then you may be able to spend time manually adjusting minutely the distances um, to make the music look less mathematically even. Um, this may be the answer. Um, but when there is much repetition of similar phrases, one may want a more radical solution. Um, next example, please. Um, and in this, this Bryce Quartet, um, there is a lot of repetition here of these two ideas, two bars, um, contrasting things, but the way they're laid out on the page just doesn't give you the contrast. Um, the typesetter has recognized the need to offset the vertical bar lines, but it isn't enough um, because of the large number of similar repeats um, going down the page. So I've tried um, a really quite radical solution in this case. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this uses um, some repeat, um, some repeat signs, some beat repeat signs, um, which um, this solution won't be to everybody's taste. Um, maybe you don't want to use those. But what it does is give this page a really pleasing variety of, of graphic image. Um, and this counteracts the visual boredom of reading too much of the same configuration. I have not used, you'll notice, um, bar repeat signs that force the eye to switch back to the beginning of the bar and repeat, and um, which often risk losing your place. Um, this can be a problem, as I found uh, while singing um, the, next, um, the next piece. Um, my ex extract from uh, Pierre Norgaard's Vianne Kintz. Um, this is a lovely piece of time setting, um, a good stay size on a standard choral page, um, clear to read, but these last three pages are just um, not practical layout um, to perform from, um, which is a real pity um, because they, the performances always suffer as a result of the two, these two types of repeat which are um, on these three pages. Um, the first one is the other uh, small bar repeats where you keep having to look back to the beginning of the bar and given that you are changing the meter all time between the crotchet meter, the four, four semiquavers, 
and the 16 meters, so the three semi quavers, you need to be thinking ahead. This is really fast as music, and it's having to spit back before you move on is, is really distracting. Um, and it's actually quite difficult to remember whether you've repeated it in each little section. Um, so that's a pitfall in itself. I um, mean, it is easy to lose the, um, the beat and to get behind. And um, that's, that's an easy thing to do with a group of singers. You're all getting behind the beat. Um, and then the problem with at the end of the, um, of the music, when you go back, with the Del Senio, when you go back um, and repeat, you're on moving from one meter to another and you just don't have enough advanced warning because your eye is having to move back and find where you're returning from. And every single time we do that transition um, to the Del Sogno, you are spending a lot of time in rehearsal, rehearsing this geography um, of, of moving around um, from different pages. And um, how many pieces do we know where Rehearsals are like that. You spend time rehearsing the geography of the piece rather than rehearsing a fluid performance. And in this case, it would have taken another couple of pages to have written out the music in full. And you know, that's always worth considering now. We don't need to save paper um, and plates in the same way um, that traditional music did a long time ago. So it's worth wondering asking the question, do we need repeats that might possibly trip up anybody in performance and can we get rid of them? So that is one significant area of my concern about layout. Um, a different one, um, and my next one I'm going to discuss, is stage size. Um, and I find when I'm looking at student scores in particular, um, for large, um, when they have large scores, they produce um, a very, very, very small stage size. Uh, and I'm always asking, well, which, what conductor is going to be able to read that? Um, certainly I can't. So I'm always asking the question to them, as an engraver would do, um, how large um, can I have a stage size on a page and still fit in all the staves that I need? Um, and what is the that balance uh, between that? Um, the conductor needs to be able to read what's on the page. He isn't just looking at the score. Um, how large can you make the score? Just being aware um, of, of that stage sizes um, are the decision of the person doing the setting and really, really need, need to be as, make things as legible as possible. Um, when, the, when the score is for large, uh, sources, um, how can you reduce the number of stays where your vertically densest page um, allows you the same legible stage size throughout? Um, next example, please. Um, this is the opening page um, of the Debussy um, prelude arrangement um, by Colin Matthews, and here we um, chose. Um, a score size between about um, 9 by 12 inches, as it were, about uh, between A4 and A3. Um, so it would be a convenient conducting score, not too large. Um, and then we looked at how large could this A size be uh, so that we could, re we could read, it could be legible and fit the densest page. So we chose 3.5 millimeter um, um, stage size. And then you will see that that is just about comfortable for fitting the densest page. So I, um, next, next example, uh, which is the page 19 of the score, where you can see um, the, um, the stage sharing, where you can have that um, between the different instruments in the woodwind and brass, where, where you have the same, same instruments. Um, so standard and of doublings on, on a given stave. The engraver must judge how to compress the score in these densities. Um, when, and sometimes you can have two or even four parts on a single stave um, to reduce the depth and still be le legible. And 
my next example, please. Um, the clinic Horizon Circles. Um, I love this score because I love the way that this has been rather masterly compressed, the layout um, of the pages. Um, I show just the brass section of a couple of, um, of three pages of the score. Um, and the arrangement of the rest and the stems and the, the attention to detail in this way has worked out um, very successfully. So you can, you can work out exactly who has which dynamic uh, and which rest. Um, whether a conductor it would be happy to try and disentangle that very quickly in rehearsal is another matter. Um, and you may not elect to create a, such a complex stave, but it's an interesting to, um, example to observe that you can have um, that extreme compactness um, should you be asked to uh, re-engrave the score, the score of Gura Leader or some other huge, huge piece um, where you need enormous amounts of staves. So engraving chip choices need to be flexible to allow for all kinds of, of layouts. Um, and there is such an art to creating a workable and elegant solution on the page. Um, for instance, um, a percussion part with a vast array of instruments. So, um, next example, um, uh, Veni Veni Emmanuel. Um, I asked um, Busy Hawks if I could um, have a look at the, um, the actual actual part that's used. Um, this piece has had I, over 500 performances, um, so presumably this um, can't be too bad for um, the percussionist to read, although I was surprised to see it laid out in this way. Um, it certainly gives a very dramatic and impressive visual sense um, of the changing patterns of timbre and instruments. Um, and I can see this would be the natural choice of the composer. Uh, the part does mirror um, uh, James's original manuscript very closely, I gather, as does the published score. Um, yet many players, I think, might prefer something um, that was rather more compact. So um, I've done a little, little propose my own layout here. So that's the next example. Um, <laughs> everything on, on one stage, looking incredibly different. Um, of course, you could probably have a two-way ha um, into something between the two um, on two staves or one stave in a group of lines. But I thought, well, can I get this to work um, with a very, very shallow um, stave deck? Percussionists um, are always complaining um, that they have to read far too many staves. Your eye has to travel up and down the page. It's just not practical when your eye isn't on the page most of the time. When you're looking at the conductor, you're, you're managing all your instruments. Um, and so, yes, you need to have a few more labels here, which the percussions can highlight and circle in color or whatever. But on the whole, I think the contour of the various instruments is preserved well enough. It is, of course, a pity to lose the individual lines for each instrument. Um, where, in fact, if you're reading it like a score, that would be helpful, but that is rather more like a score. Um, so I would argue um, that um, maybe you don't want to keep that original layout. And next slide shows the original layout in the score, which does look very impressive, um, and which led me to think, oh gosh, um, surely the part can't possibly be written out in this way. But um, the part was worked out with um, Composer, player, and um, editor. So it must be have been what they what they wanted. Um, but um, you know, as as a set of um, instructions, um, I think having the score layout is is less critical for the player. Um, so uh, yeah, that's there's a choice. There's a lot cho choice there. Lots of choices there when you come to, to laying out the, these multiple instrument parts. So when preparing an orchestral set, a typical decision is um, for a percussion section of more than one player is do you have a percussion score or do you have individual parts? Um, the norm is often to have a, have a score if you can have page turns so the players can see the distribution that each, each other have um, 
which can be useful for swapping things around according to different kinds of stages. Um, and it is surprising how much you can sometimes fit on a double page of a percussion score. Um, next example, please. Um, this is um, a page I've taken from um, George's um, opera written on skin. And it's simply a double page where um, we were able to use um, lines rather than staves to reduce the amount of vertical space needed. Um, and you can manage to fit quite a lot of music before the to try to try to reduce those page turns, which are always a real problem with percussionists, uh, especially when they have several stands um, and so on. And then using a five-line stave for tuned instruments, um, which is a nice visual difference, um, a helpful device for reading at speed, using that stave only when you've got tuned percussion. Um, it gives a really clean part um, when you have these minimal minimal amount of information on it. And that's a really important point um, with orchestral parts, with or with any, any part that a, when a player needs to be looking away from the part as a conductor, um, following other players, just to have as little information that you need. Having said that you need to have all the information to play the part, but to keep repeated information to a minimum, especially for percussion where the player is doing so many other things, hitting, sustaining damping, stopping sympathetic vibrations, um, and probably being quite a long way from their music stand as well. Um, so ensuring that staves and lines on these single part for one player are close together is, is an important feature of reading the music so that vertically your eye doesn't have to move up and down the system too much at once. Um, so I'm going to move on to looking at a couple of pieces of piano music. Um, so firstly here, um, this next example, um, a couple of additions, um, just a tiny example um, of two additions. Um, and in the left-hand extract, you'll see the stays. Um, someone's, uh, yes, someone has used that advice, keeping the piano system the two staves close together so that it's easier for the pianist to read the whole uh, system in one go very easily. Um, but they, it's so close that it supports the very ugly non-alignment um, of the, um, incidentally, editorial um, dynamics. Um, the main point for showing two contrasting editions like this is the choreography of the piano parts. Um, and how that is can be represented in different ways. Um, the, the engraver will need to make a decision about um, a consistent arrangement of hand distribution um, and how that is laid out uh, on the music. Um, he might even need to make decisions about how chords are distributed or passages distributed between the two hands and to make that clear from the notation. So the figure in bars two and four demonstrates um, the same hand distribution, but um, placing it in different places on the, um, in the part. Um, the associated board editor, um, York Bowen, was a piano professor um, at the Royal College of Music for many years and prepared this edition, um, presumably um, for education purposes in mind. Um, and just a major editorial decision. The left-hand notes stay in the lower stave, um, and um, as a result, with um, with cleft changes, um, presumably to help young pianists. Um, although this does this layout does follow um, the earlier published editions of the piece. Um, and then um, you won't be surprised to hear that the um, right-hand examples. Um, which have the layout as given in the Berenreiter and Henle um, publications um, are actually following the original manuscript and both hands are moving to the upper stave to play these passages. Um, so that's a snapshot of how a very small piece of um, a passage work can look very different and in two different, um, in two, with two different approaches. Um, 
moving on to the next slide, um, this is um, a, a piece again which, uh, if one edits the, the distribution of the hands and wants to really um, show in the notation how it should be played, that you can produce um, music that looks very different. So the original Giga um, manuscript um, is then reflected very closely um, in the um, most modern, modern edition here. Um, the next slide of the two editions um, side by side. Um, so you'll see that the Bernwriter edition is very close to what, what had the manuscript had um, and show, you see the contours of the music across the stave. It's very much a score layout um, as it were, um, but as the composer uh, saw it. Um, and the associated board edition, which again is for education purposes, is imposing a particular hand distribution um, which makes the music look so incredibly different um, and which may not necessarily be to everybody's liking. Um, so um, this, these are these are very different. These are very different things. Um, the skill most required um, of the engraver is the most critical to the life of an orchestral or ensemble um, piece, and that is preparing the orchestral parts. How does the player find their way in the part um, when they have no other information in, in performance other than the notes that they're going to play and their rests? So um, it's um, the organization of cues for instrumental parts, um, which are very important in this respect. And could I have the next example, which is the Hindemith um, Horn Sonata, uh, which I've chosen, which I'm very fond of this example, um, of this engraving, um, which is very compact spacing, and I love the, these rounded note heads. There's a um, this is particular look to it, um, which is which is rather rather refreshing, and um, the fluency and evenness, not too even on the page, is, is lovely. Um, the, uh, what is so interesting is the um, assiduous cueing in this horn part, um, where all the important melodic material in the piano part is given in the horn part. Um, uh, usually as a single line, there are some chords, I don't know why they have bothered to put in chords um, on the second page, but um, anyway, it's, it's fine. Um, but what I like is the simultaneous um, rhythms of the piano part uh, when the horn has the long notes. Um, and I think this would be terribly useful, especially for a young or nervous player, sustaining long notes, running out of breath. Um, they might easily miscount um, those phrases. Um, there is no danger of that in this part, which is terrific. Um, so rhythmic cues um, are a very, very useful means um, of uh, a, their marvellous eco economy of space and information. Um, next slide, please. Um, the Elliot Carter, um, very typical of Elliot Carter's parts um, to have these rhythm cues um, in. Uh, they're so compact and they really give the information that um, probably is all that you need, which is coordination with other players, um, and they can be read simultaneously with such detailed and demanding parts. Um, so that's probably all you need. Um, and then when the, the uh, cue stave is written in, where you need to see the pictures for the Rizandi. Um, otherwise, you just have the small notes, um, which is a very, very nice um, way of laying out parts and you can really see what you play and what is the cue in particular. Um, next example, um, I've chosen uh, a piece um, which as far as cueing goes is very difficult to cue because there are no distinct um, melodic lines and the rhythmic material 
um, isn't particularly suitable for cues. There is a lot of repetition, um, and the, the engraver really needs to um, assess, you know, assemble other information for the player as signposts through the piece. In when there are there are lots of tacit sections for lots of the players. Um, so in this piece, we've cued it by um, having instrumental entry labels. Um, through the long rest periods. And um, when we do need to create a cue, um, you have used a series of isolated notes or chords um, to combine into, into a pitched cue as at um, uh, the cue leading up to H. Uh, one reason for in uh, including this particular page was what happens when you have uh, independent players or Senza Missoula players uh, who are not following um, the direction of a conductor and how are they going to keep together? Um, how will they coordinate um, it? Uh, here we have three players who are independent of the orchestra. So in each of the parts, the two other players are cued on cue staves. And um, in this instance, we put a cue stave each side of the player's part um, because the system of um, signalling each other was to have um, an arrow going away from the player to signal that that player cues another, and then arrows to that player when one of the other players um, uh, passes, passes material to them. Um, so this seemed like quite a good way to show this quite, uh, show this quite clearly in a, in a, in a score. Um, with melodic cues, um, you, it's very easy to put um, too much information into the part, um, which can lead to a frightening array of information on the page when the player turns um, and there's a lot of fast music to get through. Um, the aim has to be to try to keep the part um, with minimal information in cues so as not to cluster it up um, with too much blackness on the page. So the, uh, the engraver should look at the how to reduce the amount of information on the page. Um, so uh, next example, please. Um, this is an example that I have um, concocted to show um, that it's very easy when you are extracting parts to leave in a lot of information that is from the score by way of extra clefs. Um, extra articulation in cues, and it is really helpful to, to reduce this as much as possible. So, um, taking out articulation on cues unless, and taking out dynamics unless they're absolutely essential, uh, placing the cue in the player's cleft wherever possible, and to avoid the player reading a cleft they don't normally play. Um, and to avoid those um, cluster of clef changes, um, placing the cue at a legible octave um, and not on a lot of ledger lines, um, and sparing um, and sparing use of, of clef changes um, for, for the cues as well. Um, the cues, the, when there is a cue clef in close proximity to an entry, um, then it can be tucked in often after the bar line. Um, I like to keep the instrument clef all the time. Um, I just think it looks very peculiar for the player to open up a part, um, and like in the left hand example, to see that half the part is actually in the bass clef. Um, and you're the core on blade player, so what is going on? The initial impression isn't great, um, and it's, um, it's just nice to have, have both of those clefs there and to have the player's clef present, but that's a personal preference. Um, it's, it's good to be careful about clef changes in general and where they go. Um, they create an unnecessary barrier um, around bar lines, and to place them arbitrarily in the middle of a group of multi-rests, for example, um, well, they're just not going to be noticed there. So um, try to get them at the end of lines where they are good cautionary 
um, symbols for the next line. And um, basically the music then will be able to be read more fluently throughout. Um, inf information overload can be a problem if there is too much, too much um, information on the page, like um, extra things that are really not needed. Um, um, my next example um, is the um, piece of Julian Anderson's uh, percussion part, uh, and the composer is very keen to ex um, to write in open ties um, in every note to every note that should be rung on. It's very much a composer writing down how he hears the sound um, in his head. Um, and this information has been transferred to the part, but it does add a rather unwelcome layer of information to the page um, for the player to read, um, which just isn't necessary. Um, one single laissez vibre sempre at the start of the piece, at the start of each entry, is really all that is needed, or one open tie at the end of the passage. Um, so it does look very beautiful, the page, but it could have some of that information taken out. Um, and one can't, can't repeat too often that dense notation, which is difficult to decipher at sight, is going to possibly inhibit a musician from making the very best of their performance art. So I will conclude with some thoughts on common notation options, decisions for the engraver. Flexible software options have to be available for the composer, the editor, to facilitate elements of individuality. But at the same time, one must, one must not sacrifice the facility of the musician to read the page most easily. Um, next example, please, um, the Lukashevsky. It is very possible a composer may take a misguided decision to make a score look more elegant. Um, and it in, maybe and to look more individual, whilst at the same time not noticing that the decision to move the time signatures above the staves for both the pianist, uh, the repetitor, and for the choral, um, for the choir, um, is just completely impractical and incredibly irritating when you're trying to sing this. First thing you do, of course, is get out the pencil and put back in all those marks into all the staves. Um, there, um, enharmonic spelling choices um, are a big feature that, um, as editors, one is working on um, looking at uh, do you have the best spelling in both tonal and non tonal pieces, those to make the greatest sense of musical lines and um, and also for chords and for, for keyboard players and so on. Um, next example. Um, this example, this vocal score example is from The Tempest. Um, you still have me? Yeah, okay. Um, this example um, is uh, a vocal score that I um, edited of Tom Addis's um, opera. Um, the choices for um, enharmonic spelling are incredibly important for singers. Uh, and I went through this score um, and to, ch to check that the lines were, were had really, really sensible intervals um, that, that were singable. Um, and then I made a point not only of checking the vocal lines, but making sure I added enharmonic equivalents, as in after figure 120, um, where the, where, um, where the ch uh, phrases naturally change between sharps and flats, and putting in small notes um, for the enharmonic um, notes. Um, I also looked at the piano spelling um, and to see if um, how I could relate this to the um, singers. Um, it's really useful if you can spell the lines in, in the accompaniment to agree with, with the vocal lines um, so that they can see how their parts fit um, harmonically and whether they've got unisons and so on. 
Um, so if you look at Prospero's entry at the bottom of the first page, you will see that there is one enharmonically different chord in the piano writing, the F sharp and C sharp, um, which is different from the D flat in the singer's line, and you can see musically um, why that is the case, um, uh, that the lines are the the um, priority has been to spell the parts enharmonically, um, uh, linearly, um, rather than vertically, um, to help each musician in turn to, to play, their, play and sing their part. Um, highly chromatic music will need um, needs a lot of help often to not only re-spell notes um, so the intervals look um, sensible and recognisable to play, um, but no one wants to spend rehearsal time um, endlessly querying pitches, which can be can happen all the time. Um, and uh, next example, which is um, the um, natural adding natural signs, which haven't been added. Um, it's um, I just created this crazy example to show that it, it's necessary to virtually. Um, put an accidental against every note here um, to confirm what it is because, well, it's written in an incredibly unmusical way to start with, but it was really a challenge to see how, how many uh, natural signs and other accidentals um, one didn't need to look in in order to, um, to, make, to make this practical. And I think one would need a performance note just to say what the accidental system was and how, how you'd used it to avoid confusion. Um, so, next example. Um, three, uh, three, uh, three excerpts from uh, Chopin, which I've chosen, um, really to illustrate that um, choosing the position of symbols can make a difference to the legibility, and it's very important um, to terminate uh, octave signs um, in sensible places for the player so that they can re they don't misread um, an octave of a following figure. Um, and you will see in the first uh, example that the octave signs finish as soon as the pitches descend to four ledger lines. Um, <clears throat> this addition is, has, you can see, it has decided to use more ledger lines than cleft changes compared to the other two editions. Um, the, uh, the Henley edition um, places the octave sign exactly where Chopin wrote it, um, which is between a pair of repeated notes. Um, and this edition has interestingly re replicated that exactly, um, which I find very bizarre and um, not particularly helpful for the pianist himself. Um, um, and in the lower, uh, the Peters edition, um, the octave sign is placed um, to me in the most musically fitting place, which is between the largest pitch shift between the uh, chords. Um, so you have something, you have three editions there showing different features, making, having made different editorial cho choices about uh, placing those signs and whether to uh, how many cleft changes also to implement as opposed to ledger lines and which produces the best legibility um, and the best look on the page. Um, so all of those elements are what the engraver um, mustn't overlook uh, when writing when writing these things out. Um, my final example um, is uh, to do with um, something I'm sorting out a lot of the time in scores, um, um, the notation of rhythm and the consistency of notation in rhythm. Um, thinking through the practicalities, if the composer doesn't quite seem to have done so, um, and I'm afraid just because the composer has found a way on his software um, of producing something that, that looks like the left-hand example here, doesn't mean it's going to achieve the most um, synchronized ensemble. In fact, the upper two lines are all the same tri triplet rhythms, 
um, the, and the notation should um, indicate that they have the same basic pulse. Um, the players should think of their rhythms in the same way so that they have the greatest chance of playing together, of course. Um, given a slow tempo, it's always useful in full form to divide uh, tuplets in the middle of bars. Um, as you will see, I have done on the, in the right-hand example. Um, and certainly, um, when the, the tuplets go over two bars, um, I don't know how players are going to keep together. If you've got more than one playing the same rhythm, um, I'm often sorting that out so that you can have the best chance of everyone being together. And also the best chance in the score of the conductor seeing how many notes are, to, are placed together. And you are forcing the player to think of the middle of the bar as well, which should help them to keep with the ensemble. So to conclude, these are thoughts, um, these thoughts are the results of um, my day-to-day -day preoccupations um, with interacting with music. Um, I see um, good engravers are becoming even, even better um, when they really think what to put on the page as well as how to put it there. Um, addressing these issues will produce really high quality engraving um, and this in turn will bring us the greatest <coughs> help we can to our fellow musicians. The elegant music on the page will earn their goodwill when they work hard to deliver what you demand from the page. Uh, thank you very much. Elaine, and now I wonder whether there are questions. Yes, please. Hi, going to Jack Marsleka. Uh, the thing that came up most often in your talk is about dealing with composers, I think. Yes. How do you manage their egos? <laughs> they have a very specific way that they want to write, and you know it yes. better than Yes. Yeah. You. I think you. You respect what they want to do, and you. Or you generally negotiate compromise. Um, when. When you can't. I. I really. I feel that one can never tell someone exactly how to. How to. If they want something changed, you. If you want something changed, you have to suggest it, and. Usually, I will not. In, insist on it. I will produce the materials as as they want the notation to be written, and then I will hope that they will get feedback from the players or the singers or whoever um, that what they how they how it's produced is not actually what's wanted. And if when I'm worried about this, I will go to a rehearsal and find out what what actually happened and whether the players were happy with what had been written and how it had been written. Um, if, if, there is a, if, there, if it's an issue I can sort out before I'm producing the material, then I will. I mean, I won't have a composer telling me you know, what the orchestral players need. Um, I will be phoning the librarian and asking precisely what they need, um, assuming that, that that talk hasn't already happened. And what I'm doing is, um, it, when notation is often awkward on the page, it's often the composer is struggling to realise their ideas, and you are helping them to um, to do that by re-notation, by pointing out, out similarities that they have. They might have different ideas, which are all the same, actually, um, on, and should be written in the same way, and they may mean that they don't want you to change that. So you, you need to talk them around and point out what those are. Please ask a question, I will repeat it. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for your paper with a number of examples. And I would like to comment on the two slides at the very beginning. Maybe we can show it if you skip to the very beginning. The first is of trills, tremors, and harmonies. Harmonics. It's what I think it's the third one. 
Could you understand that? Can you hear me? It's a no, question. Sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, it's a question about the trills, tremolos, and harmonics. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, please. Sorry. <laughs> People will come to the microphone. I hope you can hear us better. Or maybe, where's the microphone exactly? This is. No, no, I need. I need, I need to <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, so my, maybe I introduce myself. My name is Andrea Lindmeier Pamela. I'm a musicologist from the University of Salzburg here. And I do a lot of editions, so that's, and I'm a musician also. Uh, on this slide, you, uh, you said the, trem the notation, uh, you have the three different ways of notation for the more or less the same thing. I would say it's absolutely not the same. First of all, this. Uh, this tremolo at the, at the very end, the last two bars, I, uh, have, don't have the same meaning as a trills. A trill is, has always a kind of freedom in it. It's yes. If you have a, a, a at the very end, this tremolo is a very uh, has another meaning for me. It's also more structural than uh, the the trill is more embellishment of a note, and the other thing is a more structural element. And the third thing is that I think the engraver was really thinking about that, what he was doing, because the trills, the first trill is a regular notation, you trill with a half tone, with a D flat, so that you need this B above the line. Uh, and the third trill is uncommon, because you have this third for, for uh, the, the trill note, so you have to notate it in that way, otherwise you wouldn't have the idea to take the E flat. And the, the second trill is something in between, so it prepares the reader that something <laughs> will come which is be read in the same way. You also could do it, you're right, you can do it as a, the first trill, but it helps the reader to be aware that there's also another way of using uh, a second trill note. You know what I mean? That's why yeah, I would yeah. interpret this example very differently. I would say there was an engraver or, or uh, someone who thought about it, and he was really thinking with the musician, and he sees the difference between a trill and uh, a tremolo. You want to say something no. to that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. Yes, I. Th I mean, I think I agree with most of what you're saying. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah. It's. Um. It's. I would. If I mean, if I was changing this example, I would. Change only the maybe change only the tr the second trill, the the notation in that to match the first one. Yeah. Assuming that with no other information, it, it would be the same yeah. kind of interpretation. Yeah. And then I would leave everything else. Yeah, you understand only the second trill when you read the third trill because then you have this special notation, which you are prepared with preparing with the second trill. But basically, I would say there's a very interesting case where very subtle. The music is very subtle in this. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Tremolos yeah. and, yeah. uh, and, and uh, uh, trills and such things are very different things. Although they might sound more or less the same, but it's different from the music uh, standpoint. And the second example yeah. is uh, on Ligeti. If you go on a, f a few uh, slides further, yes, this is a wonderful example. Uh, I mean, normally uh, uh, a score is for both for the performer and also for the reader who reads the score, which reflects also the acoustical uh, impression. In this case, it's only the acoustical impression. I don't know if, you, if all of you know this piece. It's wonderful. It's like Rauschen, I would say. Yes, it's, it's so quickly done. And it's exactly what you see in the page is the acoustical uh, result. But for the player, for the performer, is very, very unpractical. As you mentioned, uh, you could do uh, vertical lines to organize this, uh, this uh, material, but this is absolutely not the right way, because when he, uh, when he would like to help the performer, he would pay, could do it much easily. He could say the first, uh, is it the first, maybe the first four notes, he should repeat 27 times. So make a notation of the first one, write 27 times above it and go to the next uh, difference. It's the way how I would do as a performer. I would count them and would say, okay, seven, three times. Then the next thing, three times, four times. And then you have a kind of shortcut of the notation, which helps you much more than this. 
And uh, no one of the performers uses this chord for the performance. It's just for starting to learn uh, to learn the music here. And uh, the, impress the uh, interesting thing is, is nobody. I, I'm sure nobody is counting. Also, harpsichord player, nobody is counting 55. Uh, intervals in that way, you have to get uh, the feeling for that. Yeah, how long the duration is, and then you change it. But the shorter ones you can you can count, but the longer ones is a question of time, of duration, and you have to learn practice to learn how long it is. But what I see says this is a special case where the notation is absolutely specifically a reflection of the acoustical uh, result of that, and not a performance pre a performance. Uh, notation, and I'm happy that we really did it that way. <laughs> it would be very interesting for us to study the music. But uh, the performer has to perform it at some point of time as well, and there is something to be said for sight reading. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah. Oh, you can't sight read that. <laughs> yeah. Not in the tempo that he wants to have it. You can. You can. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't dare. <laughs> but anyway, you can you can discuss on this example the difference between the acoustic as well the uh, score as a, a, a reflection of the acoustical result and as a performance uh, tool. I think that's an interesting example for that. Okay, that's all I want to say. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. Please, please come to the microphone. And you too. So I ask all people who have questions, please come to the microphone. It's a bit unfortunate, but it's healthy. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is David Kosvina. Um, I just wanted to continue. Uh, we're talking now about uh, the Ligeti continuum, perhaps. Um, a suggestion about the uh, simplification of notation. Um, this also came up in the uh, Macmillan um, uh, uh, percussion concerto um, with the solo part, where you also prepared a simplified version of the solo part. And I know that this has been done uh, by a number of people. Um, I was thinking about a, a piece by uh, a German new complexity composer. It was a solo trombone piece which was notated on about three, four, five, ah, there, thank you. <laughs> uh, about three, four, five uh, staves, one stave for dynamics, one stave for position on the slide, etc., etc. Um, and I remember coming across a trombonist who was preparing a performance of it, and he was producing this, he had all to one stave. Um, and the question is also, uh, do composers sometimes use notation to mystify rather than demystify <laughs> their music? Do the Sorry, could you repeat the question? Could you repeat the, que the end of the question? Uh, it was about this, do composers sometimes uh, use notation to mystify rather than demystify their music? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I think they, there's, there's the, there is an alluring, um, um, you know, the notation can look fantastically beautiful on the page, and I think that can, that can really tempt a composer to writing something that looks good on the page. I mean, I think that's a very, very big danger. Um, now that um, a composer can uh, get a, a large commission, for instance, an important commission, and they feel they need to write down a lot in the score, they, they can overscore pieces um, by thinking they need to look impressive on the page, and I think that's a big danger. Not for everybody, but, but for some. And yes, um, to try to make the score look individual, to invent ways of doing things, um, but you know, I think it is fine for Ligeti, as the lady said, I think it is fine for Ligeti to do what he, what he wanted to do. It's, it is, you, know, you justified that very well. I think that is entirely up to a composer of Ligeti's calibre to do that. 
um, and to show how he felt about the piece. Um, the problem I have is that other composers want to copy that and they don't have the same rationale behind why they're doing that. And also they copy it um, in the pieces for ensemble where um, rehearsal time is wasted. I know the performances sort of Rehearsals sort have of fallen apart because they have insisted, a compo young composer has insisted on using a single beam for a whole piece, and there is not time to coordinate it if you don't have markers on the page. So it, um, using it in a solo piece is fine. Um, I should have chosen an example from an ensemble piece to make that point. Um, but yeah, I, um, I agreed with your rationale for that. Um, and the, the trills, the trills and tremolos. Um, yes, you made a you made a very good point for that too. But um, but I would change I would change one of those trills so that there were only two ways of writing. There was only one way of writing a semitone or tonal trill. And I think it's just that one piece of information. If I'd seen that, seen those couple of bars um, in isolation, just. It just gives you a chink of doubt. If you see something that isn't consistent on the page, you immediately do wonder, does the composer know exactly what they're doing here? And yes, um, that page would be fine to show those subtle differences between interpretation of, of tremolo and trill, but you have to know that that's exactly what the composer wanted. And to me, that part is not really marked up sufficiently to, to show that. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Mike hi. Solomon. I'm an engraver and a composer. Um, and I have a question for you about practical tips. Uh, to those of us that are engravers, maybe without revealing too many industry secrets, if you could give a couple pointers um, about one thing that I've run into in some recent projects and that you talk about a lot here, having to do with attention to detail um, over time. So considering that engraving is a time-based art that when you start at 9 o'clock, you're fresh and you've had coffee and maybe at 4 p.m., you're, you're less attentive to detail. I found that that problem is compounded by notation software um, and the fact that as scores get bigger and bigger, visual software either gets laggier, meaning that to move one visual element in the software might take like 30 seconds based on other layout elements that are, that are being laid out, or if you're using compile-based software like LilyPond, um, making a small change and compiling it again could take two to three minutes before you see a visual result. So the natural fatigue that you have kind of at the end of the day is compounded by the lagginess in the digital realm uh, that, that you're looking at. I don't know if you've faced that before, but I was wondering how, how do you keep yourself um, attentive to detail uh, in larger scores um, while fighting this kind of lag or slowdown that happens in, in the digital realm? Well, I think you have to. I think you have to have a variety of um, of tasks that you can do at, at one time, so that you can. Um, and I think, and for me, it's it's yes, it's rest, resting eye, resting my eyes, um, and doing something physical between bouts of intensive looking at screen. Um, I mean, I used to do a lot um, when I was freelance, um, at the beginning of my career, um, of proofreading, for instance, and that is incredibly hard on the eyes in the same way that doing very detailed screen work is too. Um, and I think you need to choose a very different task. Um, do, do these the intensive work in short sections. I'm sure there's um, hopefully there's some other people there amongst you who, who have maybe found really good ways of, of dealing with this. Of course, this is a really massive problem um, because this, this is work you need to get on with to um, you know, to, to fulfill what it, you need to do. And it's a frustration um, if the concentration is sapping because of, of these, um, these slow maneuvers and, and the, the, intense, um, the intense nature of the work. It is intense work. Um, we're all looking at um, you know, um, lots of lines and, um, all day, every day, and you know, that, that has a big impact, I think, on, on, on eyes and energy. So I, I would recommend going off and doing something else at very frequent intervals. Good morning, Elaine. Thanks very much for the Hello. talk. Hi, I'm Norbert Gerschert, Hainle Publishers. You might remember me. I think we met many years ago at Favors at some point. Uh, Elaine, 
uh, I was surprised about the um, the amount of responsibility uh, that is actually in your job now, and I was wondering about the kind of team um, that you're working in, because a lot of the decisions that you've been describing, actually, uh, I would um, expect an editor at the publishers to have prepared things for you. You know, when it comes to anamonic uh, decisions or how to lay out a part, um, all the details you've been talking about, some of them, I, I have the feeling you're already working as an editor, and not solely, in inverted commas, um, yes. uh, as an engraver. So could you yes. tell us a little bit about the, the team set up at Faber's? Um, and so whom are you working with and who, how is how's the work actually distributed between uh, people who are responsible for the outcome? Um, well, there are, there, are, there are two of us in-house editors. Mm -hmm. um, and my colleague, who is in charge of running the department, is um, does quite a lot of um, computer um, setting as well, and correction work. And I do almost purely editorial work and proofreading and preparing, as you say, preparing all of this, this editorial work, preparing this um, for um, a team of freelance engravers. And they have been trained by us and work with us. Um, I mean, some of them work for lots of other publishers as well. They have been trained uh, and know what our house styles are, or we supply them. Um, as you say, talking about layouts um, and how you want things prepared in orchestral parts um, done, then yes, we have templates that we prepare. A lot of these are standard templates um, as found in software too, but um, we prepare. Um, what we want for them. We, we prepare the score in a particular way um, so that when parts are extracted, um, it, we have the, the styles that we want. And I concentrate on when the scores are, are come, come into us, when the files come into us, or the manuscript from the composer, I concentrate on looking at them editorially and looking at the notation and sorting out um, you know, what is actually what's needed on the page and, and, and what's there, checking it, check, checking it all off. And it depends, sometimes I, that responsibility does go to the, um, the engraver, and that, especially when you're in, a, you're in a hurry, you've got um, you know, a number of orchestral pieces all needed at the same time. They're, they've all been delivered late and there's hardly any time to do with them. Sometimes you simply do not have time. For instance, we had an instance of that at Christmas, um, the piece came in after the office was closed and shut down for Christmas. The piece went straight to the engraver. So um, he, ha he had to make all those decisions. I didn't know what was going to be in the piece at all. So I couldn't um, anticipate what notation would need changing. That had to go to someone. They tidied the score. Um, so they did need to know all of those, those things to be aware as much as possible of those decisions. Thank you. I'm Timothy Jarek, I'm a composer and engraver, and um, one thing that you said, uh, I think we are talking exactly about legacy, is you mentioned the overscoring, and I find that like, a fascinating term, because very often, especially in the contemporary music, um, how new pieces are generated, how new composers basically make a breakthrough, is of course through commissions, through competitions, and uh, basically submitting pieces uh, to uh, juries or to, 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 to uh, decision makers, so to speak, uh, without, of course, giving like an auditive examples of that. So basically everything that we have, and this is something that, that I've been hearing a lot from my colleagues, composers, is uh, what we have on paper. And now the, uh, when you mentioned overscoring, um, I would like to raise a question whether uh, composers who are exactly like trying to put so much information, which then becomes either redundant or intelligible or whatever, uh, poses basically or makes a vicious circle um, in which more issues arise, uh, both for understanding of the same music and also for later engraving and publishing of such music. 
um, to make something simple, is there a way we could be breaking this? Sorry, can you repeat the last bit? Is there a way, or is there something we can be doing to basically break the cycle of like okay. generating very complicated, um, yeah. some, sometimes like uh, like fancy looking, but still oversaturated music? Yeah. Um, well, I think I think the problem uh, composers are, are often composing by by example, and they're seeing very technically difficult pieces written by um, their you know, older composers. And um, I think it's the inexperience of younger composers um, who are often writing music which is far too uh, difficult in, in, the, in the context that it's given. For instance, they'll be writing concerto difficulty passages um, in orchestral pieces. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a lack of calculation of effects. Um, and as you say, to look too impressive um, on the page um, is, is counterproductive because um, a, a player will have to work very hard to make the effects. But, but, but they often say to me they have to fake something because you can't, you can't play it in the time um, needed that, that, that you've got. So. Um, uh, I do try to. I mean, I think that's that is an editor's role, and maybe that's an engraver's role too. If there's no, if there hasn't been an editor, if they do need to um, have that role as editor too, um, to 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 point out to the composer things that are incredibly difficult. You know, they, they, that might might be things that are technically very difficult. You know, stretches that are impossible, um, phrases that are far too long, all, all sorts of things which are not practical. Um, the composers are, can be very, very resistant to changing them because they will cite a score where um, another composer has written exactly what they have and say, well, so, well, Strauss did this in such and such. And you think, well, yes, that was fine in that context. It's not fine in your context. Um, and I think that's a case of learning and experience on their part. Maybe they don't get many um, commission, orchestral commissions, so when they do, they are writing things that, which are not um, quite fit for purpose. Um, and I think um, as they as they mature or um, get older, that actually some of those problems disappear. But I, d I don't know how to break that um, how to break that cycle. It seems that um, every composer feels they can write um, as technically demanding as they want to in any given context, uh, which to me is, um, is 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 not the that shouldn't be the issue. It should be about the quality of the piece and how they can create what they want from the forces they have without making massively excessive demands um, on performers. Dear Elaine, we have now three last questions, then we have to close the session. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, uh, hello Elaine, I'm uh, hello. David, uh, David Kastrup, I'm involved with the Lily Pond typesetting program, uh -huh. and uh, my basic question is, here you have uh, presented a lot of cases where individual decisions uh, into uh, making a score uh, were involved uh, and uh, how you have to talk to editors uh, and uh, in engravers uh, how they should solve individual cases. Now the problem with automated uh, typesetting these days is that you not just have individual decisions that may warrant changing, but that uh, there may be systematic programmatic decisions that are uh, a problem overall. And uh, what kind of, uh, of method do you have to get to the people writing the programs, other than uh, writing a book and uh, telling them that way, uh, to, uh, to get the in information back. I mean, uh, in olden times you could talk to engravers, those were human people, and now you'd have to talk to programmers who use, uh, who, who use uh, a program that they have designed and that has certain restrictions and where uh, certain decisions are not as easy as just moving your hand. Uh, 
So there, there will be a lot of resistance against some proposals and less resistance against others. Do you have a yeah. process to actually talk to the people who create the programs uh, in order to get the programs closer to uh, what same type setting would involve? Well, we, this, this is precisely what we did when Sibelius was first developed. Hmm. Um, and you know, we, we were developing it with them in order to produce the first published score on Sibelius, which was George Benjamin's Ansara. Um, that's exactly what we did. We worked with them. We had a wish list of things that we wanted, and those gradually developed. Um, and um, uh, if anyone wants to come to talk to us about that, then um, that, that's that's fine. I'm not. We're not actively looking for uh, to use a lot of different kinds of software. Um, the problem with a um, you know, there's, there's just two of us editors, and you don't want you want your pieces produced on similar systems, not having it a whole load of different typesetting systems at the moment. Um, you know, you're needing to manage um, that, that great um, you know, over of, of everybody's works um, and different versions, and make sure that um, all you have files of pieces that are preserved and that are that compatible and that we can access them when we need to correct something or make a different version. Um, and so we we generally haven't um, found we haven't found a need to to approach um, other 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 systems and um, or managers to see um, to see really um, to use anything else at the moment. But um, I can imagine that um, a, a publisher who might want very specific um, uh, music logical, for instance, um, doing text editions, and may want a very different style and re a different rethinking of, of um, how, we, how things should look on the page, might well want, want to work um, with another company. Okay, thank you. So basically, you have to have one particular program and one particular person to work with, uh, and then you cooperate uh, in well, while this program is uh, in its early phases. Um, yeah, well, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a practice, it's a it's a t totally just a completely practical um, managing managing files and ma you know managing all of that music. I mean, we have. You know, there's so much, so much of that, yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Pickett. Um, I work with um, Vine Berner, and my projects at the moment are making scores and parts of uh, Beethoven symphonies with Mahler's Retouchen in them. And so we just finished the nice thing. We started in Sibelius, we had to finish it in Sibelius, but that was a real long story, as I'm sure you can understand, because it was put in in 2000 in the first place. Um, but I wonder, you said earlier on in your talk that we've got lots of space. We can open things out and what have you. But I wonder if it's also your experience, which is certainly mine, that sometimes the programs want you to use too much space. For instance, the Beethoven scale, so we, you know, parts can come out with only eight bars on, on a line, and it looks, you know, it's not leg legible for the player. The player wants to see the groupings and what have you. So you have to in intervene there. But more than that, if, for instance, you look at the older scores, the older engravings, which were done in, in Leipzig and in London and so on, Novellos, Elgar scores, Mahler scores, which were done in Leipzig, you often see that Hairpins, dynamics, uh, all kinds of indications are written over the stave. Either the stave has been scratched out or else it's still there. And, and today, you have to force that to happen because the, the programs are so smart, they always want to have white space around everything, and it means that you have to fight it. And in fact, the question is look at those scores, anybody. They are very legible. You hear music when you see those scores. The, the men who were doing it, the women who were doing it, they knew exactly what they were doing, and they weren't following a rule. There must be white space around every happening. So I wonder if you also have that kind of problem. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I do agree that um, often the default is to have too much space 
Um, it's it's um, and I I personally love to have music very compacted, and particularly in cues, for instance, I want those to be um, very 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 short, um, so that they look different from a from a part. And and if you are engraving Beethoven, then I'm sure you, you could have a very very if the music is able to doesn't have too much change of dynamic and phrasing and so on, then you can compress it hugely. And I think that that is exactly what I would want. I, I don't want my eye to have to travel further than it needs to um, for, uh, for some very simple passage work or something like that. Um, and I agree that um, persuading the like the system or persuading the engraver to um, use less horizontal space is, is something that I am doing all the time. There is another aspect to it, and that is, for instance, in the new versions of the Marvis scores published in, in, by the International Marvis Gesellschaft, uh, you find that there's 50 pages longer than the first edition. Because of, <laughs> this means the conductor's turning over every three bars sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's a, pro that's a problem, and it's, it's, a co it's a compromise, because maybe the individual symbols are slightly less legible, but um, yeah, that that's um, yeah, that that's, it, that is a problem. I agree that music can take up far too much space now, and with so many page turns, it just isn't practical um, to use for solo instruments when the, when you have when you have you know, a, a page for a solo in cello over four pages, whereas it used to be two in an old edition. You know, it, it's it's it looks it looks great, but it just doesn't work as as a you know as it's not fit for purpose. Right. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, Elaine. My name is Lana Wolf. I think we have met <laughs> once or twice before. So since it happened that I'm the last one in the queue, I'm not going to open new issues by asking you a million questions. I have on my mind. I just want to thank you for this very, very good um, keynote, which surprisingly opened up a lot of issues we would not have thought about during a keynote. So we are already in the middle of a discussion, not only the aesthetics and the, the fit for purpose questions you raised, so what is the eye and the ear, how are these related to the notation. We are also in the middle of the discussion, what purpose and what, uh, um, what roles do the, all the parties take on in this very chaotic business. I can't um, come up with another term for this. Um, economic situation in which, under which we all need to fulfill very hard jobs every day. So thanks a lot for you to bring that up and of course thanks to the organizers who made that possible that I have the impression for the first time that the parties come together and can speak up openly about their problems and maybe this will help all of us to structure our business in the future better. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Dear Elaine, thank you very much for this long session, and for the long talk and the very nice questions that you answered. Um, I will now conclude the morning session. Greetings to London and all the best to your ankle. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.